Hey, hello everybody and welcome to Valkenswad. It's round five of MXGP and it's the first sand race of the year. And our guests on the studio show today are Adam Wheeler as always. We've got Dirk Grubel, the MX2 team manager for Red Bull KTM Factory Racing. Uh, last week's winner in MX2, Tim Geiser for Honda Garibaldi. And uh, a little bit later on, Sean Simpson from Hitachi Construction Machinery Revo KTM. And normally at this point in the show, we we show you some highlights of what happened a week ago, but a slightly different structure this week. Adam, um, we're going to come straight and talk about MXGP. It is round five. Uh, it's the first race of the season in the sand. Um, and the championship really is starting to take shape, isn't it? Um, but before we talk MXGP, let's talk a little bit MX2 first. Yeah, Tim Geisha taking his first win last week, Paul, in the hard pack of Italy. Perhaps not so much a surprise, but yeah, I think, you know, from the results seen so far this season, Tim almost came out of nowhere a little bit uh, on a very difficult surface. So uh, a first uh, Grand Prix win for Slovenia, I think, in the history of the sport. So that was quite a, a milestone. And, uh, you know, also, importantly, as much as it was a good win for Tim, it was also the first time Jeffrey Hurlings had been beaten, you know, straight up without injury, without a mechanical problem in over two and a half years. So... Mm. Um, you know, that's got to be some kind of uh, psychological, I wouldn't say blow for no. the Dutchman, but uh, it's certainly going to help the HRC rider. Um, this weekend, the sand's going to be a difficult prospect for anybody who's not Jeffrey Hurlings, you know, number 84. But, uh, you know, it was great to see Tim getting that first win because he's been overdue for it for last season. He emerged as a podium contender and um you know now we hopefully he'll be able to get a couple more yeah well, a couple of race wins last year yes. but we've got some emerging talents in mx2 haven't we um, paul jonas obviously tim we've already just mentioned and we'll talk to in a moment but um you know after i guess after that sort of jeffrey and maybe um dylan and maybe geordie there's some great guys coming through that we need to keep an eye out um you know the, the standing guys for instance you know valentin and uh, julian um bright futures in MX2. Yeah, if you, look, if you look across the, the paddock line as well and look at Kimea Yamaha, you yeah. know, you've got two rookies there, Benoit Paterel and also Brent Van Donick, yeah. you know, just settling into the top 10 in their first year, which I think is pretty incredible because, you know, you've got riders that obviously different rates of progress, different rates of development can come in straight away and make a big impact and others that just need a season or two just to get to up to speed and learn the whole physical side of it. But um, What about MXGP then so far? Um, Trentino was the first time really that we saw the main protagonists shooting out the start from the very first lap being right where they wanted to be. And we may, when, at the moment, from this early stage in the season, we're talking Ryan Villapoto, Tony Cairo, Clement Sound, Max Nagel. Paul Lamb was in there as well. Um, what did you make of Trentino as a race, uh, first of all? Fantastic race. Like you say, everybody close together. Uh, that first moto didn't have a great deal of position changes for the lead because it was a hard track to pass. Typically Italian, as you can see here, very bumpy, very narrow. You know, you had options with lines, but actually moving across to pass somebody... I think it was uh, maybe Max Nagui said it, it required some contact even to do it. So it was it was great to see them all that close, you know, and it was a tense first moto. Um, but Nagel, I mean, his setup on the factory Husqvarna so far, Paul, is just is making him almost unbeatable. I mean, we're looking at the guys here, um, Tony Cairoli, who are on board with now that first race battle with him and Max Nagel. Ryan was never too far away. DeSalle was right in there in the mix. But Roman Fevre also, uh, a rider that shone in the hard surface in Italy last week. Yeah, let's not forget he's an MXGP rookie this year on that factory Yamaha. And, um, you know, his progress and, and, and the way he's riding that motorcycle has even had a negative effect, I'd say, on Jeremy Van Horbeek, mm. who's, you know, as we saw, 12 podiums last year, struggling to even get in the top five this year. So, you know, Roman's just come in and the impact he's had within the team and also in the championship is fantastic to see as a rider first time out on the 450. Shame he made that mistake there when Paul Lamb yeah. went by. But the Hondas were showing a bit of pace last week as well, weren't they? Great in qualifying, but... Um you know, they're looking to maybe step things up and turn things around this stage of the season before things get too late, you would have thought. I, I, I think the HRC team need a big result. They had it in MX2 in this, in this meeting, but in, in MXGP, uh, like you say, Paul, they got it done on the Saturday, but uh, on the Sunday, we didn't really see those red bikes at the front. This was obviously one of the moments of the race. Um, Max Nagel tried on several occasions to find a way past Tony, didn't he? But this was the closest he got, but Tony just ran him wide, a little bit needle. Similar time in the race, Couple of corners further back, Clement de Salle taking third away from Ryan Villapoto. Um, and it was really starting to build to a crescendo, wasn't it? In, in terms of, wow, here we are, this is what we wanted to see. Yeah, it was a case of who's going to make the first mistake, uh, who's going to take the risk to make a pass. Tony Cairoli just cheered on by all the fans there. It was a great atmosphere for the first European race of the season. And, um, you know, I, I mean, look, you can see all four riders there, Ryan Villapoto slightly further back, but it was. Uh, 
oh, it was a great first moto to kind of op open this European stint. Mm. Well, the big news, obviously, from last week came in the second race in MXGP, the crash from Ryan Villapoto. Um, now, I'm not sure if everybody's seen it, but it was a pretty spectacular crash. Um, I know we've got it here. Um, again, really, really strange. There was a press conference last night at the workshops at Schindel. Yeah. And uh, the result of this crash is Ryan Villapoto not here this weekend. He said it's a rookie mistake. He said just got on, bike started to wheelie, couldn't control it. And uh, I think it's three or four fractures of the, the cockets, the lower back. So for that reason, you know, KRT team of Ryan have decided to sit out this Grand Prix, which is a big shame, obviously, for the championship, for him, for all the fans. Um, and hoping to be back in Spain. I, I'm not sure if it's one of those kind of injuries that needs a long time or a short time. He said it's not actually that painful standing up, but sitting down, you know, is, is another thing. Mm. And obviously to do the sand. This is what it looks like from the GoPro. Yeah. Just I mean... We asked him, you know, kind of what happened because it's, it's almost such an unusual thing to see at this yeah. level, wasn't it? Well, it is. But, uh, well, that was Trentino. Um, you know, I think it's time we met our, our first guest. And this guy made history one week ago by becoming the first Slovenian to win an MX2 uh, Grand Prix. And uh, he took his first ever Grand Prix as well. Of course, we're talking Tim Geiser. And while Tim makes his way to our seat to get himself comfortable, let's hear what he had to say within moments of crossing the line one week ago in Trentino. When you are leading the Grand Prix, it's really tough because uh, everybody is pushing you. You are in front and uh, they chase you. Three laps uh, before the finish, I did mistake, almost crash, and then also the lap riders was in front of me and uh, they blocked me a little bit. Jeffrey uh, gained. Uh, some uh, seconds and uh, he closed really yeah, on my wheel, real wheel, and uh, yeah, it was game on. <laughs> then in the last lap, he, he made a mistake, he crashed, and then uh, actually, I didn't know it. I was just pushing hard still the check and flag. It was really something special, you know, uh, to win uh, a GP for first time. Uh, actually, at first, I didn't believe that I did it, but. Then uh, when I hear everybody around the track and uh, it was, then I know it, that I did and uh, yeah, it was just unbelievable. Well, some great scenes there from one week ago at uh, Pietro Murata at Trentino and Tim Geiser, our MX2 winner from. That race, of course, is here. Congratulations, Tim, MX2 Grand Prix winner. It obviously feels amazing, it must sound great. How many times have you watched the race back this week? Yeah, thank you very much, first time. And uh, yeah, it was, it was really something uh, special for me, first time. And, uh, Actually, I watched uh, over here in press center yesterday because uh, we went directly from Italy uh, to here. Uh, we made some uh, practice in Lommel and uh, Erston. So, yeah, actually, I watched just over here in press center uh, first and second moto. There were some great scenes there as well. And while we were playing that clip, we was, both Adam and I were looking <laughs> at you and we could see some of the motions were coming back again. Um, exactly. I mean, it's just a big occasion for you, isn't it? Yeah, big it, was, it was a big moment uh, also for me, also for the team, for uh, Slovenia, for everybody. I think it was, uh, yeah, it was first time for everyone, like I said, and it uh, was really emotional, something special. We haven't seen too many images of the action from that race, you know, in that short clip there, Tim, but that track was brutal, you know. I mean, it was so bumpy, so difficult, but you were attacking it so strong and so hard. I mean, how was that possible? You know, did you find, uh, was it a setup thing? Did you find something to change on the bike before that race? Or did you just feel completely comfortable with that kind of terrain? Actually, we, we did uh, testing a week before uh, and uh, we changed something on the bike, on the su suspension setting, uh, also something in the engine. So uh, I was feeling really good all weekend long, uh, also in a qualification race, also for a second race. Uh, but I think on the track like that, the key was uh, start, of course. Uh, have a good start because it was really tough to pass the riders because the track was uh, yeah really tough uh, many bumps uh, they put also water on the track uh, during uh, between the pauses so yeah it was like icy you know so it was really tough to pass but I know you get 
quite a lot of attention back home, you know, for being Slovenians, one of you know, the top motorsport athletes. Um, but how did you get any kind of reaction? I know you said you came straight here from Italy, but were you getting messages or people sending emails or yeah. showing you know, newspaper <laughs> coverage, anything like that? Was it kind of big? Yeah, it was, it was big and uh, yeah. I was dreaming about that when I was a kid to become the sportsman like that, to win the to win the GPs and uh, also one day uh, if God gives me the world championship. So yeah, it was really dreams come true. I mean, we look at last week and say what a great occasion, a big moment. You were the first guy to beat Jeffrey hands at, you know hands down in what well, since 2013 with both you and him and everybody in the race, but. Um, it's not really a big surprise. Last year you won two motos, uh, one in uh, Brazil, the penultimate round, one in Mexico, and also in Thailand earlier this year. You know, the first race you were with Jeffrey right at yeah. the beginning of the race, so it's not a surprise, is it, that suddenly the result came? Actually, last, uh, last year when, uh, when I won two uh, motos, uh, Jeffrey was not uh, in the race. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was in the Mexico, but he was uh, injured. Yeah. So, yeah, actually was was this year first uh, first that I beat him uh, straight up uh, without any uh, you know the bike failure or uh, crashes but yeah uh, for that I'm really happy and uh, also Thailand uh, you know was the first moto I have a pretty good start I was behind him and then uh, yeah I didn't feel I didn't feel all moto comfortable on the bike uh, because the heat was uh, really big you know it was 30 35 degrees and uh, yeah like that you don't get don't get those temperatures in Slovenia <laughs> no actually you know uh, when we was in Europe it was minus it was almost zero but then we went there it was uh, 35 so it was big <laughs> different you know <laughs> yeah. also for the body for everything but obviously these are the early laps of that first race um, because the second race you had problems. You mentioned the heat a moment ago. Um, what was the situation there? Because we know about Jeremy Sewer, we know about Jordi Tixier, but you also had your own problems with the heat. You weren't allowed to start the second race, and which is a shame because when we see this and see how close you were to the front, okay, Jeffrey pulled yeah. clear eventually, uh, you know, by a few seconds. I think you eventually finished in uh, third place, maybe. Yeah. But um, you know, what were your what were your own <coughs> personal problems to do with not being able to start the second race? How did that all come about? Actually, uh, in the warm-up, uh, in the free practice before the races, uh, I crashed and uh, hurt my muscle, femur mm -hmm. muscle, uh, really badly. So I was not able to stand on the leg. And uh, everything, you know, together and also the heat and uh, pain. Uh, and then, you know, it was tough race. It was also a new, new track and everything. And uh, all that together. On the end, uh, like like you can see, many riders from MX2 was beat up, you know, uh, like uh, like you said, uh, Jordi and uh, Jeremy, and then yeah, after 30 minutes, uh, after 30 minutes after the race, I was feeling pretty okay, you know, but uh, but uh, doctors give me infusion, so doctor didn't allow me to race, so yeah, it was hard break, but anyway, that sport and yeah. it happened. And what about here? Last year you were 10th overall here. Um, obviously it's first race in the sand this year now, coming back to Europe. 10th um, overall, how much sand riding have you done this winter to allow for, you know, for you to get a better result this weekend to keep your championship uh, actually, alive? Actually, we taste and train a lot in the sand because, yeah, it's important to train uh, because in the sand it's just a training, training, training. You have to ride in the sand and... Uh, I think we have really good uh, settings also for suspension, for everything. So I'm really looking forward for this weekend. Tim, you're 18, yeah. right? So, you know, you've already won your first Grand Prix. You've theoretically got five more seasons in MX2. Um, you know, if Jeffrey Hurlings moves up to MXGP next year, Dylan Ferrandis maybe stays or goes AMA racing. Um, I don't know. It's look, the future's looking good for you in the category, isn't it? I mean, you can be, afford to be patient. You don't have to think, oh, I've got two years to win this championship or I've got one year. I don't know. You, you must feel pretty good about where you are in MX2 right now. Yeah, it's, uh, we have to still uh, wait for that because, uh, yeah, we have this season in front of us and then we will think about uh, next seasons, you know. So we are focused now on the races, each races, and, uh, yeah, try to, be, uh, try to be on the box, try to do our best every week. 
It's going to be difficult to beat Jeffrey here this weekend, oh. but um, <laughs> you know, obviously, if you did, it would be a big occasion <laughs> like last week. You know, probably even bigger. But um, you know, what are you hoping for? Then put pressure on him at no, all, no, no, no. <laughs> no. But you know, that's the reality, isn't it? Yes, we know what he's done. Uh, he's won ten motos almost, the last yeah, five times we've been here. Of course, of course. But yeah, like I said, I will do my, I will do my best. I will try to grab as many points as I can, and uh, you know, it's good for the championship because. Uh, I lose a lot in uh, Thailand in the second race. I have big uh, hole over there, zero points. So yeah, no mistakes anymore. <laughs> Can you not let his tires down in the waiting area? Or <laughs> <laughs> He's running for any move. That's not possible. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> just... <laughs> it's like a big nail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Tim Geiser from uh, Honda Garibaldi, thanks for joining us here. Of course, wish you all the best tomorrow. Congratulations you. again on your win last week. Uh, what was a, an historic. Uh, occasion for you. Um, we're going to welcome much. our next guest. Um, he's going to be the, uh, well, he is this year the MX2 team manager for KTM Red Bull Factory Racing. We are, of course, talking Dirk Grubel. So uh, while Tim makes his way out and Dirk makes his way in, um, that was a nice little chat there, wasn't it, with uh, Mr. Geiser? Absolutely. Hello. He's always, uh, he laughs easily, you know? Yeah. It's um, got a good personality. It's uh, for, for such a young kid as well, Paul, I think is incredibly mature and, you know, somebody who, I don't know, has a bright future. I think one more we didn't discuss, but one more year in HRC. Mm. So uh, he's going to be staying on that bike for another year. And I think that kind of stability is important as well. Well, I'm now pleased to say that we are joined by Dirk Grubel, the uh, MX2 team manager for KTM Red Bull Factory Racing. Uh, last year, he was technical director. Is this a role that you still... Um, have as well as being the MX2 team manager, or is it you know one or the other now? No, it's both. Still, yeah. still maintaining the same position as a technical director, forcing the development of our bikes, and so yeah, it just came on top of it. Let's say. So you're wearing two hats now. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> not really. No. Um, but obviously, Stefan Evitz was the. MX2 team manager, um, what happened there in that respect? Is it just that he's concentrating on the junior stuff now, or is, um, is there a yeah, little Stefan, bit more to that? Yeah, Stefan moved on. I mean, it's also part of the reason is, uh, yeah, his son is getting older and he's getting to uh, to an age where he's also starting racing now, doing uh, 65 uh, European stuff. And yeah, it's, it's quite also time consuming, as we all know, when you start racing. And if you it's your own son, I think you want to spend as much time with him as possible, of course. This year, you've got a slightly new look team. Uh, Jeffrey stays, uh, Rob, uh, Paul's Jonas comes in. Um, are you happy with how things have been going so far, particularly with Paul's? With Paul's, actually, everybody was really surprised. I mean, we, our goal was to get him a uh, top 10. And then, uh, yeah, later in the season, top five. But uh, the way he was riding first three GPs, uh, second GP already, first podium, that was really a big surprise. So. Well, just looking here in Thailand, you know, uh, second GP of the year, and this was his first of two podiums, wasn't it? Um, because he was second there, second also in Argentina, uh, Pauls. So we'll talk Jeffrey in a moment. Yeah. But um, not easy conditions in Thailand, as we've heard from Jeremy Su, who was previously on our studio show, and of course, yeah. Tim Geiser just a moment ago. But um, for someone so young and... You know, his first year, really, full season in MX2. That was an impressive performance from, uh, from Paul's here. He was in second position, yeah. uh, just chasing Jeffrey in the early stages. Second race, this was. Yeah, at the, at the beginning of the races that we also saw last week, he, he's, he's kind of flat out. He really tries to stick with the front runners, uh, <laughs> Jeffrey now. And, uh, but there, he, it was an awesome performance. Also, he did really good with the heat from not being from a hot country. Like, Latvia is... <laughs> <laughs> It's not so spoiled with the with the nice weather up there mainly. So, but he dealt really well with it, and uh, yeah, the performance was just outstanding. What about um, the 2016 bikes you're running this year, Dirk? I mean, you know, how important has that been to the performance and the results of the team so far? I mean, also, you know, would you say that's probably some of the best machinery we've seen out of Madikoffen for a few years? Yes. I would say so. I mean, that with that bike, we made a, a big step again in the right direction. Our last year's bike was really good, but it came to an end for development with it, engine-wise and chassis-wise, since we've been running it for three and a half, four years. So, uh, yeah, last year we started really to get our hands on the new bike, and uh, it was really promising from the first day testing. And, yeah, we made big progress over the winter. It was a little bit not... So supportive from Jeffrey since he was sidelined with his big injuries, but uh, yeah, he catched up pretty good, luckily, and yeah, we, we gave him a good package that we can mm. tell now. 
We were just talking Paul's Jonas a moment ago before we started talking yeah. chassis. Um, but what about Jeffrey? Um, obviously started the season not 100% because of the complications, the ongoing complications with his leg, yes. um, which kind of surfaced again in the off-season. So started the season in quite an emotional fashion, didn't he, by winning in Qatar. But then by the time we got to Thailand, again, hitting his stride. But almost all went wrong, didn't it, in Argentina, the first yes. lap of the first race, um, getting taken out on the jump, not just by anybody, no, that's, by his teammate. That's a nightmare of the team manager, or for the whole team, actually, that, uh, yeah, you collide mid-air with your own teammate, and, uh, yeah, one guy went down. Paul somehow saved it. He still doesn't know how. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, Jeffrey had the short end of a stick and went down, and he hurt his foot quite a bit. Uh, yeah, yeah, since then he's still struggling a bit with his uh, ankle. Yeah, but it's getting better every week, and he's he's pretty soon he's back to normal. I mean, when we see the bike in slow yeah. motion, there you actually see how much Im impact the bike took, and, and the, the rider, Paul, the rider was lucky. Yeah, the rider was very yeah. lucky not to get landed on there. Of course, landed heavily on the left side. Yeah. immediately my thoughts were back to the femur. Hopefully yeah. he's up, and he and he was able to get up. And then, um, but there was a lot of damage to that bike, wasn't there? You know, suspension, front forks. We're hearing triple clamps or handlebars all damaged in that crash. Yes, it was mainly handlebars, but they, they've been complete folded backwards, and also he broke the, the throttle cable, so even if he went into the pits, I would not let him get out, sin, since the throttle housing was broken, and it's just too dangerous in that, that level of sport. We're usually talking about Jeffrey winning back-to-back -back Grand Prix. Uh, this last two has been back-to-back -back defeats, hasn't it? It's not something we're used to talking about with Jeffrey, you know, the first one, obviously, there, he was unlucky yeah. because he couldn't finish the race, but then last week, great performance, first of all, from Tim Geiser, but it was a, a Grand Prix victory that Jeffrey would probably look at and think, yeah, that's one that slipped away, possibly. Yeah, but hey, uh, in Thailand, we're already talking about consecutive runs again, you know, yeah. like we were saying, you know, how long is he going to go this time before he's unbeaten again? So, you know, you're perfectly right, Paul, but it's sort yeah. of turned on its head, didn't it? Uh, last week, unfortunately, he, yeah, his starts were not the best, so he had his, made his way up. But in the second heat, Tim was really outstanding riding, and uh, he had solid lap times till the end, what nobody expected. Some riders, they can push for five laps, but not uh, the whole moto. Jeffrey caught up with him, but yeah, with the lappers then, it took him a lap longer, let's say. And uh, yeah, the attempt in the last lap, that was just a bit over-motivated, I would say, mm -hmm. since he said, yeah, I grabbed a handful and I high sided, so that was not the right spot. But he's back on home soil. He's got a great record here, won the last five, every moto, ten moto wins. He's probably the only rider that's not feeling any kind of pressure this weekend, is he? Or is he starting to think about, actually, I could go six in a row and 12 motos undefeated? What's the, the mindset down there with Jeffrey? No, this one for sure he won to win. He, uh, <laughs> like this week I read in, in a website that he's already counting up who won the most GPs in a row. And obviously it's Roger de Costa in Namur. Mm. Uh, he's, he can make it happen this week that it's six in a row. So he's working on that record, looks like. But he's pretty relaxed. It's his home GP. He's, he likes the track and he, he has a lot of fans here and families coming out. So, but he's, he's pretty, pretty mellow. All right. And do you think it's possible for Jonas to podium this weekend? I hope for him. He, he likes sand. He comes from Latvia. It's also used to sandy tracks. Uh, He's, he told me he had a good week training in the sand, and uh, yeah, he, he feels good. First practice looked awesome, so it's a good chance. All right. Just um, back to Jeffrey for a second. Uh, I want your opinion. Do you think we'll see him on a 250 again, 2016, or do you, would you expect him to move up to MXGP? He's still going to be it's a KTM rider, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we have him under contract, but uh, too early to say. Tough question. Are you sitting on the fence? We talked about it last night, actually, when we went to a steakhouse with him, and, uh, <laughs> but we, we came to no conclusion what will happen. But let's first uh, let's bring two-thirds of this, this race season behind us, and then maybe we start talking about next year. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, Dirk Grubel, thanks for joining us. We are out of time. Best of luck for okay. the riders this weekend, not just Thank in MXG, but also in MXGP as well. Yeah. Dirk Grubel. Right, competition time, folks. It's that time again. Now, if you remember a week ago, um, we had a uh, win with Epon, and you can do that again. All you have to do to enter is answer the following question correctly. Dylan Ferrandis won a race at MXGP of Patagonia in Argentina, but which race was it? 
Was it A, race one, or B, race two? Submit your answer on our MXGP Facebook page, or for more information, go to our website, mxgp.com. Guess correctly, and you could be the lucky winner, as you can see, of an Ipon prize package that contains a bunch of Ipon lubricants, a couple of beanies, the MXGP official uh, motocross video game, as well as an access code to MXGP TV to watch MXGP live and on demand. And remember, you have to be in it to win it, so good luck with that. And also, don't forget, MXGP TV are offering a 20% discount on our season pass, which also includes the FIM Monster Energy Motocross of Nations. And don't forget also that the Get Athena Photography Competition is still running as well. Visit our Facebook page for more information there. Right, our final guest is in position, Sean Simpson, uh, Hitachi Construction uh, Revo KTM. Thanks for joining us. Um, first soundtrack of the year, I guess, after last week. I bet it's uh, quite a relief for you, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Hard to sand, more of your liking? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, we've done a lot of pre-season testing in, in the hard pack, some, an area that I felt I could improve on. So we were a bit better prepared than I, f I felt I had been in the past, but still Saturday went really well. Sunday I struggled a lot. The, the track just sort of dried out a lot, and it was like riding on hard pack with marbles on top. So <laughs> it was a bit technical. Definitely uh, looking forward to this weekend. Not only are we back in the sand, it's a bit wetter than we've seen it for a few years, you know, a little bit of rain yesterday and I think there's some rain forecast, so it's going to be rough with all them classes as well. I'm, yeah, looking right forward to it. I was thinking that this morning, that there's some one person who was happy <laughs> to open the curtains and see it tip him of rain, it would be you, so... <laughs> Yeah. You know, Hashtag Lear up. Yeah. <laughs> Can you just describe, you know, how rain affects this kind of track, Sean, and, you know, why it's positive for somebody like you? I think, you know, the rain just... A track like this, uh, in general, you know, it's been ridden, f you know, for 20 odd years, 30 years. I don't know. It's mm. been a track forever. Was the first right. year. So it, it's been, it's been, you know, a track forever, and you know, just constant riding, it, it just packs the sand up over the years. You know, even classic tracks like Hawks and Park have just got harder over the years. And what what the weather does, or what you know, watering in general does, it just soaks down through the sand, and the, the more you, water you can actually get into it, the deeper the sand becomes. So if you just water it like on a Friday before the race, then only the top couple of inches is wet and under is still quite sort of hard and, and hard packed. So that's the only reason I like it to be uh, a bit rainy before. So it's, uh, you know, it can make it a bit more technical and hopefully a few more passing opportunities. Well, how's the season been going so far? Obviously the first round in Qatar um, looked OK. First race particularly got off. Um, I think you started fourth, eventually dropped to seventh. But there was a, a big period in the race where you were happily sitting there in fifth and sixth, you know, not too much going on around you. So, you know, from that aspect, you know, a great start to the season. Um, and I guess you were looking to build on that from them. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, Starts are something we worked on a lot in the winter as well, and uh, I would say that you know my starts seem to seem to have worked out a lot better. And in, in Qatar, as you say, I was up there and from the beginning I should have actually finished sixth, but mm -hmm. um, I fell off a couple of laps to go, and uh, Roman Fevre managed to pass me. So I was battling with him all weekend, and it was just uh, it was a nice way to get the season underway with two solid results under my belt. Uh, the second race actually had a bit of an issue with uh, with vision, and the second one I got some you know uh, dirt inside my goggles and couldn't really see too well from the get-go but you know overall I was happy uh, the speed was there um, I was fast all weekend and uh, managed to have a little battle with Ryan on the Saturday I think it was and uh, you know it was just it was a nice way to open the series. I was I was going to mention that because I'd seen a tweet from you saying uh, I even managed to pass Villapoto in the race uh, yeah. quite a little cheeky tweet but um, <laughs> there's been a lot of hype surrounding that hasn't there with him coming over How have you found riding with him in general? Yeah, it's been good. You know, I didn't really know if he was just going to come and absolutely dominate or, you know, I couldn't even get near him. You know, obviously being in the same race as him, you're going to, you know, see him at some point. So it was nice to uh, not only battle him with him in Qatar a little bit and, you know, swap swap positions. Uh, I think in Argentina, we swapped positions three times in one lap. So mm -hmm. that was quite a nice little YouTube what, uh, clip to watch back. And uh it's just, you know, it's, it's good to have someone as high calibre as him in our championship and, you know, riding with, you know, the best in the world, you could say. And uh, it's not been, you know, a, a Tony show this year so far. You know, Max Nagel's really stepped up, really surprised me, in fact. And uh, Clement, he's been as, you know, as cheery and as consistent as he has been. So, uh, you he's know, actually I, been cheery, though. Yeah, no, that's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I see him, he's smiling. So, yeah. no, what's it's, going uh, on? Yeah. <laughs> but you just mentioned Argentina there. Um, you actually look to be having a lot of fun there. Uh, the track looked okay. A lot of positive comments from a lot of riders. Uh, this is that moment that you've probably been watching as well, you know, with uh, your battle with Ryan. He just found a way past Van Horbeek at the end of the first lap uh, in race one. Um, 
What's going through your mind here? You probably didn't know he was right behind you at this point, mm. did you, Ryan Villapoto? Uh, no, not exactly. I just, um, you know, you're just trying to keep the head down, really looking in, you know, looking in front as much as you can. But uh, you always hear someone revving behind you, and I think uh, I got a glimpse of a green mudguard at some point here, and then just. Uh, you know, from then I thought, oh, that was an easy pass. Well, actually, let him pass there, looks like. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what was going on. But then? But then I uh, managed to get back up the inside here. And then I think, you know, he looks like he let me back pass. He was maybe feeling a bit sorry for me, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking that was a bit easy. But from our point, you know, in, in commentary in a race, you know, a great little bit of action. But it was clean as well. There was no dirty takeout. And that's been said quite a lot. I think Max Nagel said it, um, you know, earlier on in the season when he had a race with him and there was no, there was no dirty riding between him and, 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 uh, and Ryan. And it looked all clean here as well. And this yeah. continued right the way through the next lap through the waves before you made that mistake, yeah. you know. But um, and you quite enjoyed riding with a rear brake at that point. Yeah, right. well, <laughs> that was that was a bonus. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the Sunday we we didn't get off to a great start, or we did get off to a great start actually. A whole shot the the first race and uh, ended up going down in, in you know the first ten minutes. But slightly disappointing. But then uh, you know you actually just seen Villapoto hanging off the back there a fair yeah. bit like he was last week. So yeah. just watching that clip there, but. You know, the second one, I uh, came in a bit of an altercation on the first lap with Glenn Caldenoff, and mm. uh, little, to, little did I know at that point, he'd actually severed my rear brake line. So mm. going up into, you know, the next corner at the top, as he turned around that tree, I thought I was going to try and make up some ground on Bobrushev, mm. went for my rear brake and just whiskey throttled straight into him. Cause I, I had Sent nothing, him to next week. Yeah, <laughs> nothing to stop him. So Yeah, this was, I mean, this was still going. This was... Um, I thought it was just cool to select this clip and, and keep yeah. it going right up until that point where he made that mistake. What was here? Just a, an unlucky I, tap? I, I just had a little bit of an issue through there all weekend. You know, it, I think I spoke to Clement about it as well, and he said, you know, there was actually bumps in the track you couldn't physically see. It was like it was under the sand. You know, you'd think it was quite smooth, but it was like a soft hole that you couldn't see, and it was the same on the jumps. You know, the soil was all the same colour and, and sort of... You couldn't see any kickers or any of the lines on the jump, so it was just sort of catching you out. I think Van Harbeek had exactly the same problem in, in uh, the waves there, mm. and he actually crashed out pretty big. So, I mean, talking about Ryan Villapoto there, he's not here this weekend, Sean, and, and like one of your big things you know, we've seen in the championship over the years is just this collection, this like accumulation of points has dragged you up through the standings as the season goes on. I mean, it's, uh, it's almost like it shouldn't be an unusual philosophy or a way to tackle the season, but the way you go about it is effective. I mean, it took you up to the top five of MHGP last year. So the way you started, is it, is it kind of going to plan almost a little bit? Yeah, I would say, you know, I pride myself on being consistent. You know, everyone knows a Steve Ramon or, or even back in the days, you know, you have to be consistent to be there in a championship, whether that's British championship level, GP level, you know, you have to finish races and to go for a title, you have to obviously win races and be on the podiums every week like Tony does. And that's a different level of consistency. But, you know, I don't want to just be known as a, the consistent guy. I want to have, you know, flashes of, you know, speed and show everyone what I can do and run up in the top five, which I believe I can. But, you know... I do pride myself on being there week in, week out, and you know, just racking up the points, and uh, not only myself being consistent, my, my little setup with me and my dad, my bike, you know, dad does a great job to keep that going, which is the other side, the mechanical aspect of it. And it's just, you know, it's nice to be there, and, and you really just keep racking up the points and looking at the end goal, and you know, that's to be back inside the top six of the championship at the end of the year, which I don't think is, uh, you know, is something that's too far away, really, you know? So it's, uh, you know, there's got to be question marks over a lot of guys who try and push it too hard too soon. You can burn out at the end of the season. You know, it's it's quite a, you know, I've been at this a while now, you know, as, as a lot of guys. But, um, you know, there's, there's a certain element of being smart about it as well. So I wouldn't say it's went to plan, but we're not far away from the plan. And I think uh, just need to keep pushing and uh, start banging a few results in. And Adam said at the top of the program, uh, or this part of the program anyway, you know, weather conditions might play a part in the overall result. It was tough at Lear up a couple of years ago when you took your first GP win as well. Um, but before we go, do you want to see that clip of uh, the whiskey between you and Koldenoff and, uh, and Bobrashev from Argentina? Yeah, why not? Because uh, we've got this final clip here. Um, again, it was a shame after that, after that first race. Um, but uh, can we get that? Here we go. So we came into... This was at the opening lap of race two, wasn't it? So Koldenoff there on the Suzuki. Yeah, um, I've I'm, I'm obviously just come up the inside here. You actually see Koldenoff's rear wheel break out just now, and then he just lands on the side of me. I look back to see if he's actually went down. Thought we'd got away with it, but then you just see me absolutely wiping into the side of Bobrashev there. So. Yeah. 
And I, I actually, I got up and went down the next hill and thought, I thought he'd maybe uh, knocked my rear brake caliper, which actually puts a bit of space between the discs. So I, I tried to pump the rear brake going into the next corner, nearly went straight through the fence again. Mm -hmm. So I thought, right, I've got real issues here. So it was, it was a bit disappointing to, to get up from that and not only think I've crashed and I'm right at the back of the pack, but now I've got to do 35 minutes with no rear brake around mm -hmm. this track, you know, and... It probably took me five laps to get into actually being able to ride without it. Yeah, I was talking to Bobby this morning actually. When you have me on the studio show and, and, and this kind of thing, and then we were talking about Argentina, talking about that, and he said, actually, Sean is a really nice guy. He's just gone up in my levels of, uh, you know, he's a real gentleman because later on that day you sent him a text and said, look, really sorry, but I lost my back brake didn't mean anything by it and he yeah. said no that's fine it's all cool he said i prefer that when somebody puts a hand up yeah and is really honest about it so uh, you've funny. got a fan in bobby <laughs> oh, no, that's good <laughs> it's, it's funny you should say that because a lot of the times people actually crash into you trying to you know make a pass and yeah. it's like yeah sorry i lost my rear brake and this and that and you think <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but you did. Not, yeah, I actually did. You know, so it was. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, look, we are out of time. So uh, thanks to all our guests again. Of course, uh, Tim Guy, MX2 GP winner from Trentino a week ago. Dirk Grubel, the uh, MX2 Rebel KTM Factory Racing Team Manager Sean Simpson from uh, Itachi Revo KTM. Of course, as always, Adam Wheeler on trackoffroad.com. We are out of time here. Hope you enjoy all the action from uh, Valkenswad this weekend, the MXGP of Europe. Hope you can join us for it live. As always, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye for now.